What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Hickory Scuba Marina. If you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor. Click this little subscribe button over here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys will be notified every time we upload new content. Now if the audio in this video is a little womper jawed if you will, I apologize up front. We've got a new studio set up and we're going to try to get some more green screen footage for you because in today's video I am going to be doing a commentated video and I want to be able to be on screen with what video you guys are going to watch. So what is today's topic or what are we going to be discussing? Well, if we take a time traveling trip back in time and let's go all the way back to 2018, we actually did a video with a good friend of ours who went diving and he had a catastrophic failure down at 50 feet. Now this catastrophic failure actually when it occurred, it made him run out of air very, very quickly. And he actually ran completely out of air at 50 feet. Now, thankfully he had a bailout bottle or a little pony system that he always dives with. So he was, you know, very easily was able to switch over to that, make it back to the surface, and of course survive the dive. However, he gave he gave me a call up and he said, "Look, Brian, I had this catastrophic failure. I ran out of air. I know what caused a failure, but I'm not really sure why I ran out of air so fast." So I said, "Well, I tell you what, Steve, come on up by the shop. Let's go to the pool, and we will do some testing on catastrophic failures, and I can kind of explain to you why it happened the way it did and why you ran out of air so fast." And it wasn't nothing that he did wrong. This was truly an equipment malfunction. It just happens, guys. Scuba gear still man-made. Sometimes it happens. So. As we were doing the testing, we actually tested three different types of catastrophic failures. And if you've not seen the video, I'm actually going to link it up here. Make sure you pause this video and go watch this one first. And this video will make a whole lot more sense to you after watching that. Also down in the description below, you will find the link to the video as well. So if it doesn't pop up here, just check out the link below. Make sure you pause this first, go watch it, and then come back and watch this one. But we did three catastrophic failures. The first one we did was a high pressure hose rupture. So basically we just took a cylinder, we took it down to the deep end of the pool at 10 feet and we cut the hose with a set of bolt cutters. And of course we timed it to see how long it would take to drain that tank with a high pressure hose failure. Then we repeated that test with a low pressure hose failure. And your low pressure hose, if you're not too familiar with your equipment, that's the regulators that you breathe off of. The second stages that you're breathing off of, so you got your primary, your alternate, and even your low pressure hose that goes to your inflator that is a low pressure hose as well and of course and then the final test we did was a valve malfunction basically being you got a tank on your back and you blow an o-ring between the tank orifice or the valve orifice and the orifice of the first stage it doesn't really matter if it's dinner yolk it's going to bleed off the same and we recorded the data and basically we did all three of these tests in a controlled environment and we did it at 10 feet well, since the incident for my friend actually happened at 50 feet, what we did is we calculated, okay, if this is how much air we lost at 10 feet, let's try to calculate that into a SAC rate, a surface air consumption rate, and we also tried to calculate into an RMV rate just to see how fast a diver would go through his air if that was the equivalent to say their their breathing rate and then we took that number which is always calculated back to the surface we took that number all the way down to a depth of 50 feet which is 2.51 atmospheres and we did the math there as well and we came up with a chart and on that chart if you'll go back and watch the video it'll say okay at this depth you're going to lose this much air at this depth you're going to lose this much air and so forth and so on and that video got a ton of views a lot 
lot of you guys gave me uh, a lot of good comments on there. Um, I did get some questionable comments, meaning you guys really liked the video, but you were questioning the mathematics part of it, and you were saying, well, I don't think that the math was right, and here's why, because there were certain variables that we did leave out. One of the variables being, okay, if you had a catastrophic failure underwater, what would happen if you were breathing on it? Would you still be breathing at the same rate or would you actually be taking on more air or using more air because you're breathing and losing the gas at the same time? We had a lot of comments about, well, your regulator wouldn't bleed off even more at depth, you know, if we remember how Boyle's Law work, simply because you're dealing with three pressures, whether it's high pressure, intermediate pressure, or even ambient pressure. And if you don't know much about gear, let me explain real quick what that means. Your tank is high pressure. It doesn't matter what system you got, low pressure, high pressure, it's still high pressure. When the air leaves the orifice of the tank valve and goes through the regulator, the first stage, it gets transformed or it gets converted into what's called intermediate pressure. Some people call that low pressure. So let's say a tank is at pressurized at 3000 PSI. It goes through the first stage. Now it's only going to be pressurized at say 140 to 150 PSI, we give or take, depending on the manufacturer and the style of reg you breathe. And then as that air comes down to the second stage, it's going to go through another transformation or it's going to be converted once again to what's called ambient pressure. Ambient pressure is the surrounding pressure around us and that's going to be even less so if you took a tank that's got 3,000 psi your first stage controls it down to say 150 psi your second stage controls it down to whatever equal pressure that's surrounding your body so let's say at a depth of 50 feet that would simply be uh, 2.51 atmospheres. You're only looking around 37 PSI is the ambient pressure around you. And how do we get that number? Basically, you just take whatever atmospheric pressure you are, you times it by 14.7, which is the pounds per square inch that the atmosphere puts on us, and then that's going to be the ambient pressure around you. So a lot of you guys were saying, well, since you left out these variables, the numbers can't be correct. They're not going to even going to be nowhere near correct because these are very important variables. Obviously, if you're running out of air, you have a catastrophic failure and you're breathing gas, you're going to go through it a lot faster. Well, I disagreed with a lot of you guys, not because I think I'm smarter than you, just because I have been in this industry and I have seen these catastrophic failures and I've actually done these tests before. But you guys gave me a great idea to actually go out and do the test at 50 feet versus in a 10 foot pool and just trying to do the math. So that's what we did. We went out today, we made a couple long dives today, we went down to 50 feet, we took three cylinders, we tried to get the same size cylinders that we used in the previous test. Now I do want to apologize to you guys, in the previous test there were uh, actually two cylinders that we had to take out of service and that's part of the reason that we used those cylinders because we knew that they weren't going to be passing hydro and we would be condemning them anyway so we went ahead and used those cylinders. But in today's video, we tried to match the cylinders the best we could. So if we had a 63 in the last one, we got a 63 here. If we had a 50 cubic feet, we had a 50 cubic foot here. If we had a 53 and 53, so forth and so on. So we tried to match the cylinder sizes to make this as accurate as possible. We also took into consideration the things that you guys wanted to see. You wanted to see a diver breathing on uh, the reg at that depth during a catastrophic failure. You wanted to see if the numbers could change. So we added those variables back in. Now, one of the things that we didn't do is try to make our ascent during a catastrophic failure because we actually wanted to see how much air time remaining we would have with each catastrophic failure. So during the test, you're going to see we actually stayed at depth during the whole time. And I'm actually breathing on the regs that are malfunctioning. And during that time frame, of course, once it was out of the water, I simply pulled that reg out, went back to the reg that was attached to the tank on my back and so that I could have air. Now, the numbers were very, very shocking to myself and I think it's going to be very, very shocking to you. But we're going to watch through this together. I'm actually going to commentate through it as well and I'm going to give you some pointers. Now, the last thing I want to talk about real quick is there's going to be an unedited version of this video. So the clip that you're going to see is edited. I did some time lapse. So let's say it took 30 minutes, I might time lapse that down to say 25 seconds or a minute or even two minutes. But if you want to see the unedited version, when we upload this video, there'll be a secondary video uploaded as well. And you will see the raw footage of this actual test. So if you got the time to sit through and watch the untime lapse version or the unedited version, by all means go watch that video as well. And I think it will really open your eyes to how scuba diving physics 
actually works. But with that be, being said, let's jump into today's video and I will walk you step or walk you through step by step exactly how we perform this test and actually what's going on during the test. And then I'll give you some final thoughts at the end um, on why the numbers are what they actually are. So getting started here, like I said, we are at a depth of about 50 feet. Um, and we show you that on the computer. I think part of the test was done at 49 feet just because of where we were at. Um, we're basically on a rock wall here. We're actually going to start with a high pressure failure first. Here you can see on my computer, I'm exactly at 50 feet. I've got a 63 cubic foot tank. I've got a standard first stage. I think I got an MK200 from uh, Scuba Pro here. I've just got a um, high pressure hose. I've got a quick disconnect high pressure hose. So if you guys are familiar with say a Sherwood Wisdom or something like that, you know it just pops off quick disconnect. And so I've just got a high pressure hose connected. I've also got a Sherwood um, second stage hooked as well to give me a chance to breathe off of it as well. But here I'm turning on the tank. You'll see that there's a minor leak here. This is going to be the high pressure uh, hose failure. But as I turn on the tank, I'm already starting to get a failure here. My first stage is starting to fail, and now we're going to cause a catastrophic failure. And basically, I'm just taking bolt cutters and snipping the hose here. But as I cu cut it, you're going to see a big gush of bubbles come through. Now, in our previous test, at a depth of 10 feet, we had, I believe it was 56 minutes of bottom time or air time remaining. Um, we calculated that all the way down to a depth of 50 feet, and I've actually got the numbers here from the previous test. We calculated that all the way down to a depth of 50 feet, and during that test, and during the math part of the test, we calculated that at a depth of 50 feet, catastrophic failure in the high pressure hose, we had 29.4 minutes of bottom time remaining. That simply means we have just about 30 minutes to get to the surface. So we're gonna see how it goes here. Like I said, some of this is edited. I've time-lapsed some of it um, for, for the longer parts of the video. But if you do wanna see the, the total unedited version, check out the link below. There'll be an unedited version as well. But here I've started time-lapse as well. You can see just how much air is coming out. One of the things that I did take to con in consideration here, a lot of you guys said, well, I wonder if you could kink the hose or tie the hose or zip tie the hose and make it stop. So I'm actually gonna do that several times throughout this test. I'm gonna kink the hose and we're gonna see if it works. Now here I'm actually gonna be breathing off the second stage that's attached here. And one of the things that you'll notice is I'm starting to get a little frustrated because it's getting very difficult to breathe. And if we think about the science of why that's happening, that cylinder is high pressure at 3000 PSI. It's coming through the first stage at 150 PSI and it's coming through the regulator at ambient pressure that was about around 30 some PSI, 37 PSI I think to be exact in this situation. And it was actually very difficult to breathe and it actually makes sense because now the intermediate pressure has dropped instantly because there's no back pressure on it. So even though it's controlled from 3000 to 150, as soon as that hose is cut, there goes all my intermediate pressure. So there's not a lot of force coming through that second stage at this point. So it's actually getting very difficult to breathe. You also notice some other cool things here. The tank's starting to float. We all know that aluminum tanks, as they get empty, they actually start to float as well. So you'll see that. Now I'm trying to keep the hose here. I'm still trying to breathe off the reg just to see if I can breathe off of it at depth, say a depth of 50 feet or whatnot. And for the metric guys, don't worry, I've got you covered too. It's 15.25 meters. Um, but I'm trying to kink the hose to see if I can get it kinked. Now, somebody asked in the previous video, could you not just zip tie it? You can, but let me tell you why it wouldn't work. Uh, first of all, nobody really carries zip ties with them underwater unless you're a caver or a tech diver or something like that. Even when I do overhead environments, caverns and caves and stuff like that, I don't really keep zip ties in my pouch for my side mount rig. So the likelihood of you having a zip tie is slim to none. Plus, if we think about the pressure coming through the hose, if you can't really kink it with your hands, you're probably not going to get it tight enough with a zip tie to close off the inner core. And if you've ever seen a regulator hose, that inner core is very, very durable. So I don't think that you could possibly do it. Now, we didn't test that, but in my professional opinion, you wouldn't be able to do it. But here you can see that it's bleeding off um, quite a bit, actually. And like I said, I'm testing it throughout to see if I can even breathe on it. Now, the reason I didn't breathe on this tank uh, throughout the entire test guys it was it was very difficult at 50 feet with an unbalanced first stage and a catastrophic failure it's virtually impossible to breathe off that second stage it, it took i'm gonna say almost four times the breathing effort just to get a breath out of there 
But as we get closer to the end of this first test, uh, you'll see the results. You'll see exactly how long it took me to bleed this tank off. Now, at a depth of 50 feet, if we think about our ascent rate, our ascent rate's no faster than a foot every two seconds. So with that being said, from 50 feet, it would only take 100 seconds. That's just a few minutes to get to the surface. But when you see the numbers, I think it will really shock you on just how safe this actually is if it occurred to you. So here, as we come to the end of the test, I'm gonna put the regulator back in my mouth. I'm gonna take that last couple of breaths at that 50 foot mark and just see if I can get any air out of it. Um, one of the cool shocking things that I noticed is when we do the low pressure failure, um, and it's pretty cool to see how things fluctuate every time you take a breath, so that was pretty cool. But here I'm gonna actually switch back over to, I believe, the second stage that's on the test cylinder. And so I've got it in my mouth, I'm trying to breathe here, and I can tell you, it's very, very difficult. I am getting a full breath, but the resistance that I'm having to fight through just to get that breath is, is pretty painstaking. But I've got my slate there. I'm fixing to document here in just a second exactly how long this took. Now, yes, this was time lapse, but if you want to see the complete unedited, like I said, make sure you check out that link below. But as we come to the end, you'll start noticing those bubbles are dying very, very quickly. And even at this stage, I still can't kink that hose. That inner core of that high pressure hose is so durable, it's so dense. I can't kink it shut. Um, I actually had a diver here a while back ask me, could you tighten a knot? And ask me if that's why I liked my flex hoses, because you can tie them in a knot, doesn't kink a hose. I just like my flex hoses because they're, they're slender, they're, they're, uh, they weigh less, so they're easier to fly with, and I just think they're a little bit more durable than rubber hoses. But you can't even kink them by tying them in a knot, let alone a rubber hose. But here, as I'm coming up to the last few breaths here, you'll notice I just start shaking my head because it's kind of like, okay, this... This is dumb. I can't breathe on it. You know, I should be at the surface by now. And I'm going to document the time real quick for you. And like I said, before it shows it on screen, according to the math in the previous video, at a depth of 50 feet, 29.4 minutes is the run time that we calculated three years ago during that previous test. Let's see what the final results here are. So here I'm taking the last few breaths. And I'm saying, nope, it's completely out of air. And when we stop the clock, 29 minutes of air. So the previous test, we said 29.4. Remember, we did that in 10 foot of water and we calculated for 50 and we hit it right on the head there. So we got 29 minutes of air out of a 63 cubic foot cylinder that had a high pressure failure i.e. let's say that your gauge actually blew. Now, yeah, we cut it with uh, bolt cutters, just a little bit cooler than dealing with a, a faulty gauge. But our previous test was 29.4. That was our guesstimation based off the math. And we hit it on the money at 29 minutes. So guys, if you ever have a high pressure failure, yes, it is an emergency, but it's nothing that you should panic with. You can still make it to the surface very safely. Signal to your buddy that you need to go up. You can continue to breathe off your reg. Just make sure you're monitoring your gas. Come up to the surface, even at 50 feet, I what didn't need to do a um, safety stop, but if I wanted to, I could, had plenty of air. This second test is an O-ring failure. Once again, we're still at 50 feet, as you can tell on my computer there. Now, to do the O-ring failure, we're actually using another 50 cubic foot cylinder. This one's steel. In the previous test, I think we used a 50 aluminum, but this one's steel, and instead of even hooking up a reg to it, we just decided to open the tank at depth to see exactly how long it would take to bleed off. I.e., in short, if your tank's all the way open and you got a first stage and blow an O-ring, it's gonna be coming out like this anyways. So as we conduct the test here, you'll see I've just took that cylinder, I've opened it all the way at 50 foot, and we're gonna see just how long it takes to bleed it off. Now, I know somebody's probably gonna be asking in the comment section below, what do you need to do to a cylinder when they are flooded like this underwater and you get water in them. That's going to be a separate video. We're actually going to take these same three cylinders that we use in this test and I'm going to show you just how much moisture accumulated in these cylinders after the test. And I'm going to kind of walk you through how we clean them too and dry them out. But here I'm just bleeding it off. Now this is a, um, a low pressure 50, so this is a 2400 PSI cylinder. I did boost it up to 3000 PSI. But a lot of people will say, well, steel cylinders don't really get light like an aluminum cylinder does. Well, as you can see here, the cylinder started 
in the right direction and then it went inverted. It did start to float up a little bit. What's actually holding it down is the weight of the valve itself, not the cylinder itself. Um, so yes, yeah, steel still loses weight. You lose weight from your ballast when you're diving simply by breathing up the air. But here we're actually getting pretty close to the end of this test. Um, I think originally when we did this test, let's look at the numbers again, the, uh, the valve failure, the O-ring failure, we did it once again in 10 foot of water. We calculated it down to a depth of 50 foot and we calculated 6.74 minutes of bottom time. At a depth of 50 feet, that is still plenty enough time to come up to the surface and it might even be enough air to even do a safety stop depending on how long you were there. But here I actually took the last breath off the valve just to show you and look guys, six minutes. The math worked out again. So the first test was in 10 foot of water. We calculated it down to a depth of 50 at 6.74 minutes and we just proved to you at 50 feet the math worked because we got six minutes of air out of that catastrophic failure. Now this last one, I gotta admit, there were certain things I added to this test that a lot of you guys wanted to see. This is the low pressure hose test. This is where your second stage fails. Either you have a free flowing reg. Now it says 49 on my computer, it was 49. I'm actually testing. If you see the line that I have the cylinders to, I'm actually slid down a little bit. So yeah, it's at 49 where the camera's setting, but as the tank slides down, you'll see that I'm actually at 50 feet. But like I said, if you ever get a free flow, I wanna show you just how dangerous a free flow can be, especially at depth. Now here, I'm just gonna cut the second stage hose here. And if you've never done this before, there is a percussion that comes through the water. It actually shocked me three years ago when we did this in a pool and we cut it, we felt that percussion come off. Even in an open water environment like this, I felt that percussion come back and hit me as well. But that water or that air is just flowing through here. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, this is a very, very short clip here. Um, and in our previous test at 10 feet, calculated down to 50 feet, we had 1.55 minutes to make it to the surface. That's all the air that we had. It was basically one and a half minutes worth of air. So let's see if it holds true. Now, I am switching. I've already switched over to that cylinder. I'm actually breathing off this cylinder right now. And I can tell you the breathing resistance has dropped dramatically. A whole lot more than it did on the high pressure cylinder um, from the previous test. But I can tell you this, this air is flowing through. I can actually feel the vibrations in my hand. That was something I couldn't really do in the high pressure hose. I can feel the vibration of that air coming through this hose very, very quickly. I did try to kink this hose as well. And once again, I couldn't, I couldn't stop the airflow. There were certain parts of this where I actually put my thumb over it to try to block the hole, thinking, okay, it's only 150 PSI coming through here. I can block the hole. Couldn't block the hole. It was still coming out no matter what I did. If this happens, I can tell you guys, proof's in the pudding right here. At 50 feet, there is no way to stop this unless you turn the valve off and you breathe through that valve or breathe through your second stage by feathering it. This is something most side mount divers are taught how to do. I know a lot of back mount divers, unless you go into doubles, you're not really taught this, but it is a very valuable skill, especially in a situation like this. Now you'll see that air is dropping dramatically. It was a big gust of bubbles. Now it's starting to come down. I am starting to have difficulty breathing now. I'm having to really suck in just to get air to come through and to get that demand lever to open up on me. Um, watch this. As I breathe in, watch the bubbles come through the hose because there's two, uh, two low pressure hoses here. As I breathe, the bubbles slow down. When I exhale, the bubbles speed back up and you'll see me. I'll point that out here in just a second. I'm gonna breathe in, the bubbles slow down. I exhale, the bubbles speed up. And it kind of makes sense. Think about it, air's coming out this hose, air's coming out this hose, and as I inhale, since that pressure's dying, watch right here. I breathe in, bubbles stop, I exhale, bubbles go out. That was really neat to me to actually witness that, but it kind of makes sense. As I'm starting to inhale and the pressure of the tank is dropping, I'm taking in more PSI than the tank's actually putting out at that point because the tank pressure is virtually gone at that point. So we're coming to the end of the test. Once again, as a reminder, initially we did it in 10 foot, calculated to 50 feet. We had 1.55 minutes of air. And of course our test results here are, let's see if we got it timed up just right. And our test results are two minutes. In two minutes at 50 feet, we went through our air. I can tell you right now, if your ascent rate 
is a foot every two seconds, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to make it to the surface, especially if you're panicked. Guys, I really, truly hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I enjoyed making it and I enjoy the comments that we got three years ago on our previous video about how we could have done this test better um, because we've been wanting to make this video for, for three years now. We wanted to actually go in and show what would actually happen at 50 feet. Guys, I trust the math. I trust the science behind it, the physics. I love physics and when you learn stuff like this, we have to learn to trust it when we're underwater. Um, our previous video was done because that was really the only place we could do the test at the time. And as instructors, my job is to teach new divers the physics of diving, the science behind diving. And that's what we tried to do. I really appreciate the comments, but the comments that were on there saying, well, you add this variable in, you add this variable in, and it's going to change the outcome, it really does it. As you can see here, I'm going to put the results from the previous test here. I'm going to take the results from here. Now, remember, these were calculated results. We did the test in 10 foot of water. We calculated it to 50. Now we just performed the test at 50 feet. And as you can see, they are virtually the same. So when you put comments in here, please remember there's other people that watch this videos that you could possibly be misleading. And we don't want to do that. We want to educate you guys. Um, if I ever felt like I mislead you, or if you guys feel like I mislead you, please let me know. But guys, I can tell you the science is real here. It works. The math works. If you are interested in more classes that's going to make you a more educated diver, check out the SSI Science of Diving course. Check out the SSI Deep Diver course, uh, maybe the Perfect Buoyancy course. All these classes, even the Search and Recovery class is a good one, simply because it's going to go over lift theory and it's going to teach you physics. It's going to teach you atmospheric. Heck, another good one's the Nitrox course. It's going to talk about atmospheric pressure and partial pressures, and it's going to go over your sac rate and your RMD. And you're going to be able to do the same calculations that we're going to teach you in these videos. But guys, I really truly enjoyed these, this video in particular. I enjoyed making it three years ago as well. But I love to be able to go through and update things and say, hey, we're not just blowing smoke up your ear in here. This is real life. This is what real diving's all about. I hope you guys find it entertaining. I hope you guys find it educational. If you got any questions, please put it down in the comment section below and I will try to answer it the best I can. Keep the comments coming on the videos. If you see mistakes we made here, hey, drop me a comment. We'll make another video. Like I said, there'll be another link in the description for the raw unedited version of this test. I think it's over 30 or 40 minutes long, the raw footage is. So if you want to see it, you got the time to watch it, by all means watch it. You can hear the sounds. You can see what it sounds like at 50 feet as, as you're running out of air. But check that out as well. Also, stay tuned because we're going to be breaking those three cylinders down and showing you just how much moisture actually got in those cylinders when we were underwater at 50 feet. Remember, we cut a high-pressure hose. We cut a low-pressure hose. And we just opened the cylinder without a tank, uh, without a uh, first stage on it, simulating an O-ring failure. So what do you think? Let me know down in the comment section below. Do you think that there's going to be moisture in those tanks? And especially the steel tank, how long do you think it takes to start producing flash rust inside that cylinder? Because I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a big thumbs up. Definitely share it as well. Once again, any questions, drop me a comment down below. I'll try to answer it the best I can as quickly as I can. As always, make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Pin us on Pinterest. Subscribe to us here on YouTube. And as always, guys, we appreciate your business.